Good morning. Let's all stand. All the saints and angels bow before your throne. And all the elders cast their crowns before the Lamb of God. Let's see this. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. And you deserve the glory. God, to come into your house, and not only to hear your word, but to lift up your name and glory and praise, Lord. You are the audience of one, and we are so thankful that we can give you the praise that you deserve this morning, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for the souls that are here this morning and those that are going to hear the word. And Lord, we thank you so much for this baptism that we're about to have, Lord, and and that you're, we're following the, the, what you say, tell us to do in your word, Lord, and following obedience and baptism, Lord. I pray that this picture is perfect for you. And that it brings glory and honor to you. In Christ, I pray, amen. Good morning, Landmark. Good morning. It's good to be in God's house, amen. And we're amen. excited to be doing another baptism. But Stacy, come on down. If you haven't met Stacy Hunter, you need to get, her, get to meet her. And uh, she's just been a blessing to me, and I know already. We've tried to be a little bit of a blessing to you as well. And so we praise the Lord for how God brought us 
together in church. And so you continue to pray for her as she pursues the leadership of God in her life. Part of that is saying, I want to be a part of this church here. And so we rejoice in that. You continue to pray for in these things. And God be the glory in all things that we do. Amen. In obedience to the commands of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and based on your public profession of faith in him as your loving Savior, and by the authority of the Landmark Missionary Baptist Church, I do baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. At this time, I'd like to ask of our ushers to make their way to the front as we're going to prepare for our morning offering. Uh, again, if you're visiting with us for the first time, I certainly hope that you were able to get a, a, a greeting package, a bag there from the welcome team. If you didn't, uh, just please please see us afterwards. There's some information in there. There's an information card. If you got that, I'd really, really ask that you fill those out, and you can drop them in the offering plate as these guys go by, or you can put them in the little boxes out by the door. We'd love to have your information so we can contact you and tell you about what we're doing here at Landmark and all the many activities we have going on. Um, we're just so thankful to have you, and if you visit with us again for the second or third time, we're glad to have you as well, and we hope that you keep coming to, to most importantly, hear the message and hear the word of God this morning. Amen? We're glad to be here this morning. Amen. 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 Hey, Brother David, would you mind us up in a word of prayer? saying he has made me glad this is him 214 Joy 
is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it, and this is the day that the Lord God gave us this day and this freedom to come in and to worship in his house. And we got a couple more songs left. I ask that we go ahead and stand as we get ready and lift our voices up to the Lord this morning. I hope more importantly that you came to prepare your heart for worship. This next song is called The Heart of Worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply Longing just to bring Oh, something that's a word That will bless your heart Cause I'll bring you more than a song And I'll bring you more than a song For a song in itself Is not what you have required You search much deeper
Open my eyes and let me see this beauty that made this heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am to worship, and here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. So here I am to worship, here I am to bow down, here I am to say that you're my God, and you're all together lovely, all together worthy, all together wonderful to much it cost to see my sin upon that cross and we'll never know how much it cost to see our sin upon that cross and I'll never know how much it cost together worthy all together wonderful to me so here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together worthy, all together wonderful to me. Amen. Amen. God is amazing. I want to invite you to remain standing at this time. We're going to look in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we serve such an incredible God who instills us with great joy and when you come to Philippians chapter 2, now we, we've been in the shallow end of the pool in chapter 1, just saying, okay? But we're going to get a little deeper, all right? And it's good stuff when we get further into Philippians. It's all good, but there is some really good word in this passage today. We're doing a journey through Philippians in joy. For those of you that are just joining us, we welcome you. And for those of you that have been with us in this journey, we welcome you back there's a lot of good things that we want to look to in this, so I'm going to be quiet and let the Word speak. I'm just going to read a couple verses to start off, and then a quick prayer. Verse 1, if thou, there, therefore be, if there be, therefore, don't you love Paul, um, if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Father God, the richness of your love, the depths 
of your word as it brings us to the remembrance that in this life there are challenges. In this life there are difficulties, but even greater than the challenges and the difficulties, there is Jesus, and because of Jesus there is great joy. And I pray today we are walking in such joy. We are existing, Father, more than just existing. We're not just coping. We're not just trying to get by, Father. That's, that's the devil and his lies. But there is abundant life in Christ. There is great joy. And I thank you for these reminders that you brought to my side uh, this week in the beauty of your word. And I pray that uh, I'm just simply your vessel, your mouthpiece. May we see this principle, these, these teachings, Father, so that when life hits, when we celebrate, it's always going to be about Jesus no matter what. And those who are struggling in their faith today, may they find that hope in Christ before it's eternally too late. We love you, Lord, and we give you praise, but we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So we're journeying here, and, and I got to just tell you real quick, just in a summation. So again, Philippi, we did Acts a couple weeks ago, and in Acts 26, I think it was, and and, and, you know, Paul wants to go there, but the Macedonian call comes. So he goes to uh, what would be Europe, and this will be the first European church plant. And he comes into Philippi, and he meets the women down by the river, and he has conversation, and he comes along, and you see three different conversations that happen in 26 that basically bring this church to the place that she is. But again, the reminder to us and the theme of this book is, is joy and, and, and as I navigate uh, the things that happens, again, uh, being written himself by Paul sitting in a, a prison and so not in the best of circumstances, but still the circumstance in Christ is always what matters most and that's more than circumstantial, it's permanent. And, and I want to remind you of that because that's us. When you call upon Jesus as your Savior, you are in Christ. When we saw what we just saw with Stacy, and you decide to connect to church and you, you say, I'm coming by baptism and I want to be in Christ in this. And he says, come on. And so you do that. You are again stepping into Christ and doing the things of Christ and, and, and aligning yourself with the church. I love the verse in Acts chapter 2, verse 42. The Bible tells us they were baptized and they were added we're not lone rangers here. We're doing this together. And so when we come together in church membership, that's what we see, this adding and, and growing and, and, and finding where we are and seeing what we can do. But I want to remind I want to give you a heads up and a little bit of preview to what's going to come. In chapter four, you're going to find that this church was not like any other church. They had problems. There was some arguments and some dysfunction there and Paul had to address that. I don't want to candy coat this and say, oh, what a bubbly, effervescent church. They just always had the spirit. Look at them. They're just so sweet over there in Philippi. Yeah, they're a great group of people, and they're trying to do it in a way that's God-honoring. But don't kid ourselves. They had problems. They're a real church like any other. And that's why he writes to us here, and he says, I want you to fulfill my joy. These are things that would just make me just on cloud nine in Christ if you do these things. And these are things that we can be uh, admonished in and encouraged in too, because if we're going to see real joy in our life, you're going to want to see these things fulfilled. So let me help us out with this, all right? First of all, I want you to see the word unity. And I don't really want to harp on this word because I feel like it's a word that I have peppered at times since I've been here. But again, we're here and I'm just going through the text, so I can't ignore it. Paul says, since you are united in Christ... That's basically what he's saying through verse 1. And the word if is used there, but don't let that kid you like it's uh, maybe or maybe not. The word if there means since. Since. It, it's, it's, this is a given because of. And so you are a believer, so hence. You are following in Christ, so hence. Since we are united in Christ, look at what comes because you do life in Christ. Christ will encourage you, it tells us there in verse 1. Uh, if there be any consolation, since there is consolation or since there is encouragement in Christ. Do you know that, friend? Have you figured that out by now? The world will come in and, you know, some body blows when you're not looking. But all of a sudden, you open up the Word of God or maybe it's a Sunday morning and you open up your heart to the songs and the teaching of the Word 
or the, the preaching of the word. And you notice how things just kind of start fading off in a distance? Have you noticed what God can do when we give him opportunity? That all those things and all those uh, situations don't seem as big when you know who Christ is. Christ encourages us. Let me, let me pep, say this a different way. This is not to diminish real life. It's just to show you who's greater than real life problems, amen? And there's joy in that. So Christ encourages you. Christ's love comforts us. If any comfort of love, uh, um, there's something beautiful about comfort. That, I mean, some of y'all are going like, you're not being very good Baptist, by the way. Some of y'all are thinking comfort as in a big blanket during a winter. Okay, fine. That's good. I'm Baptist. I'm thinking about comfort food. Amen. Okay. I'm thinking about stuff that's totally not on my diet that really sounds good and tastes good. Uh, matter of fact, if you don't know what real comfort breakfast looks like, come to the next brotherhood. Okay. The men's brotherhood. They know how to do it big. And, and, and it's, it's awesome. I can smell it. I just, I, I know that the Bible says taste and see, and I'm trying to <laughs> behave myself, but there's some good eating. And there's some good comfort food. I love the comfort of the, the, the love of Christ in us. And he says, if there's any comfort of love or since there's any comfort, since there's fellowship of the spirit, you understand that when you get God, you get all three and you get the beauty of the comforter, the, the paraclete, the Greek word, the, the one that comes alongside us in whatever we're facing or whatever we're going through. And so all those things come into play in verse one. And then we dive down to the bottom of verse 1, and he starts talking about bowels and mercy and all that good stuff. And you're like, wait, what? How do, how do we get here? We're talking about all this good stuff. Bowels is talking about that inward uh, burden, if you will. He's not trying to get uh, biological on us in that way. Um, there's no colonoscopy here in chapter or verse 1. Just letting you all know in advance, all right? But there is some beauty of what he's telling us. Because he's saying you're in Christ. If any bowels and mercies, these are all in Christ. Then what? Fulfill you my joy, verse 2, that you be. So because of these things, now we can do unity the way it's supposed to be. The way unity doesn't happen is when we start forgetting who Jesus is and we start thinking who I am and who you are. And then disunity rears its ugly head. Dysfunction becomes a reality. He says, this is not to be. So you want to fulfill my joy? You want to put a big old smile on Paul's face? Hey, be like-minded. That love that we just talked about, it's talked about in verse 2. Now you got it in unity, having one accord of one mind. So your heart's right, your mind's right, and you're doing the things of Christ. This is what happens. You have concern for others. And, and, and you see even in verse 2, these are present progressive words. Having, being, this is ongoing. It's not like, well, I did my part, I'm done. Now it's somebody else's part to, to do this or to do this. No, we continue in doing this fulfillment of joy. And by the way, if Paul thought it made him joyous, can you imagine what it does for the Lord? And we'll get to that in the end. So unity is critical. And, and if you're doing unity because you think you're doing God a favor, guess again, the great, one of the great blessings of church life is when you see a united group of people working together and they see the need, they see the struggle, they see the challenge, and all these people, like a, a disaster occurs in the community, and everybody just grabs and rallies and does. Well, that's, we see a disaster in society and so, and it's sin, and so we come alongside, and we show Christian love, and we show what joy really looks like. So there's unity. Secondly, there's humility. Verses 3 and 4. <laughs> I, I love the fact that Paul just checks us. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Quit making it about you. I'm just telling you what he's saying there. Don't be causing a rub in the system here. But, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So this takes away from our self-centeredness. Now, I'm going to help you out with this. It's going to be fun, okay? So don't throw anything. I'm just quoting people, okay? I'll give you the, the politically correct one first. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, a great man is always willing to be little. I like that. You don't think of yourself here. You think of yourself here. But some of y'all are going, that's too deep for me. So let me speak your language, okay? I found this one for the common folk like me. Helen Nielsen said, humility is like underwear, essential but indecent if it shows. Maybe that one works for you. I don't know. I had a chuckle out of that. I think you get the idea. We don't need to be going around being braggers, being self-centered, being selfish. There's churches are full of this mess. Society is flooded with this mess. 
A lot of I's out there, isn't there? And I'm not talking about E-Y-E-S. I'm talking about capital I. Me. I. I, 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 Can I remind you what Peter instructed uh, the Jews with in regards to this? First Peter chapter 5. He gives us some strong words here. He says, likewise, you younger. Now, he's given it. This is in bridge to some previous verses. And I'd have you read that, but we don't have time for us to do it. So you can back up if you'd like. But he's talking about the beauty of what happens when the older and the younger work together. He says, submit yourselves unto the elder. There's a lot to be gleaned from our, uh, those that are older in, in leadership and such and wisdom and experience. Yea, all of you subject one to another. So they just brings it all together and said, y'all need to work together. Can't we all just get along, right? And be clothed with humility. Put it on. Because the world's going to try to strip you of it, and you need to make sure you've got it on you. Don't lose that which matters. Be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. And in verse 6, he says, humble yourselves, therefore, under the the mighty hand of God. You don't need to do anything because he's already got it. That's what he's telling us. He, He says, that he may exalt you in due time. See, the world is all about me making a name for myself, and God says, no, 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 no. If you do it my way, I'll take care of you. You don't have to put your name on all the billboards and make yourself look like you're all that. I can do that if you let me do what I can through you. So there's humility. Humility resists self-exaltation. And at the moment that God wills, he will raise us to that point. It's not that you don't show ambition in life. I don't want to mislead you to you just say, well, pastor said I don't do anything. No, we got a system full of that, and that's broke, okay? I'm talking about the fact that, yes, You can do things, but do it under the will of God, and he'll lead you, and he'll place you, and he will elevate as it is for his glory and his name's sake. And that's how you find joy in Christ. There's a lot of work trying to elevate yourself, promote yourself. You find yourself getting miserable if you're not careful because it just becomes too much effort, and it is because you're going against the grain of the Spirit when you do. So be careful. You don't want to go there. Verse 5, humility. And now we see conformity, conformity. Verse five, and I'm bullet pointing these because I want to really get to the fourth point. I want to get to all these, but it really leads up to the fourth point. So verse five, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we we get this space up here where the flesh and the spirit come together and it's the, the, the mind is that, that place where decisions are eventually formulated to where it processes out. It's like the printer almost. The work's already been done, and now it's just spitting out a little bit. And what we're going to see, well, is there conformity? Now, boy, that's a word you don't want in most places. You want to stand out, right? You want to be unique. You want to be different. Well, for y'all that struggle with that, Jesus did remind us that we're to be a peculiar people. So don't think that you can't have your own person just do it in Christ. Because if you do life in Christ, guess what? You're going to stand out. (laughs) You're not going to be like everybody, but you have to conform. In other words, you have to lose this mold of the world, and you got to find the shape that leads us into Christ. You know, I think about a thing I used to do with my grandmother years and years and eons ago. And, you know, there was some fun around Christmas. And one of the things everybody do is get around the kitchen, and, you know, you get the cookie cutters out. And, and I just thought it was like, because it was like doing Play-Doh like I did the rest of the year when I was a little kid, you know, you get the Play-Doh and you form and all that stuff. And now you do it with cookies, so you get to eat this, so that's a really good deal. And she'd have all these shapes and different objects of star and different things, and then you get the frosting and the spring. Yeah, we don't need to talk about food right now. Conformity. That dough is just there, and it's ripe, and it has a lot of potential, but it needs to conform to a certain image. And that's what that cookie cutter does. Well, the Word of God, through the Spirit, conforms us. It, it compels us to see what we need to do. But, but the easy answer is for me and you to stand off to the side and look at a world around us that's struggling and maybe sin is just all over them and say, y'all just need some Jesus. Wash my hands of it, play pilot, and do my Christian thing. But that's not the best answer. The world doesn't need my judgment. The world doesn't need my nose looking down. I mean, they've got plenty of that from people all around. What the world needs to do is see Christ in me. And so if I'm going to be Christ in me, 
And then I'm going to have to do that differently and standing off to the side saying, y'all need Jesus isn't enough. What I need to do is do the thing that is best, and that is living in Christ. And when I live in Christ, live joyously in Christ, though I don't settle. Let me give you a thing. So in a couple weeks, and we were talking with the junior high kids this morning about this, we're going to focus on the 15th, and we got a big night plan because we're going to be out at Whispering Pines looking forward to being out with the bars and the community out there and just loving on uh, the people and having some food and it, there'll be some things about that at the end of service. But, but I w- what I want to tell you is that morning we're going to have friend day. We're going to have friend day. And I just, everybody's got somebody you know that probably needs to be in church that's not in church. And the easy thing for you and I to do is say, you ought to be in church. And the other easy thing to do is say, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to pray about it. But see, saying it and, and praying about it is nice, but that's not enough, not in our world. We have to be intentional and do more. So I need to conform to the image of Christ so that I can be the hands and feet of Christ so that I can love on them in a way and I can say, well, hey, what time do you want me to pick you up? I told the teenagers, it might be a good opportunity like we used to back in the day. You got a buddy that lives a little further away. Tell them to spend a night. You get them up in the morning, we'll go to church. What are we going to do to get people where they need to be? What are we going to, are we just going to, hey, let's all pray that our, the community comes to church. That's not good enough. Conformity says I need to do what Jesus did. And Jesus would pray, but Jesus, Jesus put feet to his prayers. I need Jesus. It's not y'all need Jesus. I need Jesus. That's what we need to be saying. And I need to do like Jesus and let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. I need to think like Christ. I need my attitude to change and conform to his mindset, his attitude. And that means my compliance to surrender my thinking. That's not easy in 2024. I got my own way of doing things. You got your own way of doing things. And Christ says, I want you to do it my way. Not this way, not that way. Now, I'm going to really put a wrinkle in this. Aren't you glad things have kind of modernized in some ways when it comes to technology? You know, it used to be if you sent something overseas, you might not get a package for two weeks if you needed to send a message. And now all I got to do is type something up and I can hit click or even I can call somebody halfway across the world on an app and it doesn't even hardly cost anything. I like technology. I like the way. And sometimes things come around. I'm glad the, the fact that when I had um, my appendectomy, um, it was very simple. It was laparoscopic years ago, and this is back in the mid-90s. Back in the day, they cut you halfway open, and you're just sitting there for a week. And I remember going in procedures after people would have bags on them and stuff. I had to lay there for hours. Man, them days are gone. They're not the same. Things have changed. What am I getting at? Well, society had moves on, and we have to in times too, in our minds, because we get stubborn. I get stubborn. I want to do it my way, but I'm glad some things in this way, I want to, things of Christ never change. What matters most still matters, and I, I surrender. So unity, humility, conformity are all critical, because then we can't really, if we don't do verses one through five right, we're never going to be able to do six through 11 the way we need to. So all those lead up to Christianity. And I want you to see this, because verse 5 kind of sets that stage, and then we see the life of Christ. Ready? Watch this. Verse 6, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. There's a lot of theology that comes in these passages, and I wish I had time to really get into that. The new members class will talk a little bit about who God is for y'all that are going to jump into new members class in a couple weeks. But it says, but made himself of no reputation. There's that humility. Took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. Being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him. That's my God. We lower ourselves and he raises up. Given him in name, which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every Knees should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. Paul doesn't want anybody to think they get exempt from this. And that every tongue should confess, no nationality. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. To the glory of God the Father. Now let me give you some things about Christianity. I've got a couple S's I want to look at here. 
and what Christianity can do in fulfilling the joy. First of all, Christianity is selfless. So we talked a little bit about that humility, and he dives back into that. But I want to remind you about the polarizing opposites. The devil is the one that likes to orchestrate and plant seeds in our mind, and he loves to build us up in pride, and then we have the right, we think, to demand and act the way we do. Christ is selfless. So I want to contrast this. If you remember, Isaiah 14 speaks to this, Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel 28. I'm trying to jog my memory. I think I'm there. Lucifer said, I will. I will exalt myself. I will do these things. I will do it. You see all these I wills. What did Jesus say? Thy will. Not my will, thy will. Polar opposites. Lucifer wasn't content being one of God's creation. Oh, no. He wanted to be the creator. Jesus was the creator. Genesis 126, let us make man in our image. Jesus was the creator, yet willingly became man and joined creation. Total opposites. Selflessness at its finest. That's what we see in verse 6. Thought it not equal, thought it not robber to be equal with God. Christianity, verse 7, teaches us another S, and that's servitude. I want to make sure you understand. In verse 7, he thought it um, no reputation, took upon him the form of a servant. Jesus is still God. He never, he doesn't take one hat off and put another hat on. All he did was, according to Scripture, put on flesh, without a sin nature, following in God's steps. That's powerful. I mean, y'all, that's, that's crazy powerful. I mean, that is like, this is what I do. This is the, the, the definition of itself and its finest of love. Here, I'm going to put aside everything over here so that I can do this for you over here because you need me, and I love you like crazy enough to do it. That's Christianity. And he says, I want, I want more servants like that. <laughs> servants today are different. You know what servants like today? Now, I'm a servant. Pastor, don't forget, my name is spelled U-N-D-E-R. You know where I'm going? We want the billboard on us. We want the lights on us. But I'm a servant. We don't know what servanthood really is. We think we do. But what we have to do is get a fresh look at Christ. And really see what servant, servant is, is a lot of things. But our world today defines servanthood. You know, servanthood is a, is, is a serious step. Servants in biblical times had no rights, very little. And yet, today, we want the best of both worlds, don't we? I, I'm willing to serve a pastor. I can't do it here, 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 or this, or this. But if you got, if you got from 12 to 1220 at night, I'm there for you. <laughs> You know, we, we got our limitations. It's interesting when you see Christianity at its finest. And, and I understand, and God certainly knows that we are human and we are limited. But we see divinity here in, in, in this, you know, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. John chapter 1, verse 1. I mean, God's more than a man, y'all. I mean, he's, he's, he's God in the flesh, he left the throne. He left everything that the throne would offer to be the servant of man. It, it just blows my mind. It, it, the, he's the epitome of servanthood. That's what Christianity is. Christianity is selfless, servant-minded. Christianity is sacrificial. Verse 8, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Christianity is sacrificial. It's part of this, his obedience took him to death and beyond death. But that was Christ's priority. Now, I want to make sure you understand something. I'm going to say this. Jesus was sacrificial. Jesus' goal, however, was not exclusive to the cross. I'm going to lose you on that one. Got you thinking, don't I? Do you know what Jesus' number one goal was when he came to earth? He said, for me. Well, that's, that's that ego. Don't, you're not wrong. We benefited. Jesus' number one goal was to please the Father. End of story. Because if, if our idea of Christianity is, 
it's all about the cross only. And I, I'm, I'm stepping into some, this limb is getting a little flimsy. So I want to make sure you understand it's always about the cross. But it can't be so busy because you and I can't go to the cross. We can carry the cross as we're called to do. But we can't go. But you understand that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. He's not done. Okay, he advocates. So the role of Christ is still to please the Father. The, the will of the Father for every one of us that call ourselves Christians is to do what? To go to Golgotha and give our life in a way spiritually, but we can't do that because it's already been done. Because when Jesus says it's finished, y'all, guess what? It's finished. <laughs> so what do we do? We do what he did. We please the Father. How can I please the Father? How can I be? Well, we find that sacrificial mindset that surrenders self, which Jesus did, so it can be all about him. We make it all about him because that's what sets up the next stage. But Christianity, you understand, is going to be costly. There's sacrifice to Christianity. Let me help you out with this. Acts chapter 20, verse 35 speaks a little bit about what this looks like. And here it says, I've showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus. Watch this. How he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, is, is, is that, Chef, is that not one of the great paradoxes? You give a lot and you're going to get more blessing out of it. The world doesn't say that, does it? Don't work too hard. Find you a way to get a bunch of people underneath the pyramid, the mug out of this thing, and then you're going to be all right. Okay? You're going to make it, and you let them do all the work, and you, you just get back and enjoy it. No, it's more blessed to give. That's th the world's view of successful business, and the church's view and the Bible's view are polar opposites because this is the way of the teachings of Satan. Remember, I will, I will. Jesus says, thy will. So we're two different streams here. And this is the danger when we try to, hey, I'm going to read this secular book on business and I'm going to be like this. And if, you're, if your secular book is more important than the Bible, <laughs> you're going to stray because your secular book is going to try. And I'm not saying they can't give you some bullet points that are really great. The problem is, is it may lead you down a stream you don't need to go. Christianity is selfless. Christianity teaches servitude. Christianity is sacrificial. There's joy. The more we sacrifice, the more the joy we get fulfilled. That makes no sense, but it makes perfect sense. Isn't God amazing? <laughs> he just totally messes up all man's way of, you know, you got these people that are real smart, and they got all these plaques on the wall and all these things, and they give you all these da 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 And then Jesus comes in, and it's like he's when he was 12 all over again in a temple. Huh, this is what you think? Okay, guys, hang on. <laughs> this, 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 and the other guys are going, hmm. And they're the ones with all the degrees. And we still got this in our world today. Because at the end of it all, I love verse 9 through 11. I really just wanted to hurry up to get to this. Because this is what we do every day. And this, this is what we do when it's Sunday. Because Sunday, we get a whole bunch of stories. We get a whole bunch of experiences up, down, in between. We get a whole bunch of life. And we all put it under one roof in various buildings across the world and we sing about Jesus, we teach about Jesus, we talk about the goodness of God, and, and then you come to verse 9 through 11. Let me just read this for you. And we see Jesus, we see all that he did, we see the beauty of the cross. i got to make sure you don't think I'm saying the cross is a bad thing. I wasn't saying that earlier. Just keep the main thing the main thing, pleasing the Father, even if that means to the death of the cross. That's why he could sacrifice and do that. Now, you see the word wherefore. This is a, like a conclusive statement. We've gotten to the support body. Now we're wrapping it up here. As a result of all this stuff, wherefore God also, don't leave him in the grave. Don't think we serve a dead Savior. He arose. It's not Easter, but it's still Easter every day. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him. Don't, don't, don't keep him like barely above. Yeah, he's highly. In other words, there's an elevation that no man can reach, no man can understand. And this is where God has risen Christ to. And given him a name which is above all names. There's supremacy in the name of Christ. You, and there's sovereignty in this. And you and I are going to let circumstance rob us of joy when he's saying, don't forget Jesus now. Here comes the comeback, y'all. It's real. Don't be given up yet, okay? So what do we see? <laughs> he tells us, verse 10, and that at the name of Jesus. So we just, 
We got that, and now we're seeing it. Every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Nobody's exempt, so there's sovereignty. Supremacy, sovereignty. And verse 11, that every tongue should confess. This is the will. Remember what, what's the will. God's will is for everyone to see the Son of God and do this right here, that every tongue should confess. Because one day it's going to happen, but it's sadly some of those are going to recognize, but it's going to be too late. Lord, Lord, have we not done this? Lord, Lord, depart from me, you that work iniquity, I never knew you. See, some of them are going to stand before him in judgment one day, and it ain't going to matter then. Can't get saved in heaven. Every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Lordship, Master. And what do we do? We wrap it up. To God, to the glory of God the Father. This is all what we do. Because in Christianity, we see the sovereignty, the supremacy, but we also see the smile. Man, at the end of the day, let's put a smile on God's face. I hope that's okay with your theology. It's really good with the Bible, so just come to that place, please. Isn't it sad what we used to do back in the day in church life? Can you just see? Look. I, I, I don't know because I didn't have dad in my life, but I had mom. And every once in a while, I'll be doing something, and I bring that report card home, and I want to make mom smile. I mean, I, I do it because I don't want to get punished. I mean, let's be honest. I, I want to make good grades. The smile's the bonus, but I really just didn't want to get grounded for something, you know. So anyway, I did the best I could, and I, I had good grades, but, you know, I tried. I had to work hard at it, and you do that stuff. And, and, and here's, here's mom, and I'm hoping she smiles. You know, you give it to her, and you're looking for that reaction, you know, it's either going to be the room and no Atari. Some of y'all know what Atari is. One button, one stick, okay? Or you're, you're you know, no, no whatever. You know, we didn't have all the stuff kids have today. So here I am. Or she's going, hey, you ain't got no money, but we're going to take you to McDonald's. Hey, good report card. Amen. All right. It's worked out good. She's smiling. I'm smiling. Everybody's smiling. You know, in church life, maybe it didn't happen in Landmark, but I can tell you it happened where I grew up. We had the preachers, and you hear the stories, and we think that God is just like up in heaven with this like real scowl face, and he looks down upon his churches, or, you know, when we say that in our terms, I hope he's here through Jesus and the Spirit, but we have this imagery of this scowling God upon, and we forget the father-son relationship, father-daughter relationship, right? Man, I want to make dad proud. I want to honor him. I want to elevate. He's already elevated Jesus. And I, I want to do these things that we talked about of what Christianity looks like so that the smile goes to him. And that's where the word glory comes. We want the glory of God to resonate worldwide. Well, I can't do that if all we're doing is talking about Pete. That's a mess. You talk about Jesus, though. That's where lives change. That's where there's a turnaround. That's where there's transformation that's where chains are broken. That's where lives are mended. That's where healing comes in. That's where understanding that life may not be going the way I want it, but God's on the throne and it's going to be okay no matter what. That's what God does through all this. We, we try to build it in ourselves. It never pans out. But I don't envision today scowling, hateful uh, I know he looks down on sin and he sees a lot of grossness, but I also know when he looks at the child of God, he says, what are you talking about if we're walking in his forgiveness? <laughs> That's the beauty of who he is. Jesus lived and died giving glory to God. And he said, I want you to join me in this. And that's what Christianity looks like. There's hope in the resurrection. <laughs> there's, there's, there, I mean, we see that. And, 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 and verse 9 says, there's no other name. It's the name of God through Jesus he, he, in verse 10 says there's freedom and, and, and sovereignty, and that's lordship. And then we, we get to where we are in verse 11, and there's joy and the glory to God. I remember in old school revivals. Some people didn't say amen, it's glory. They started yelling out glory because <laughs> it was giving God what he rightfully deserved. The life well lived is to give glory to God. God the Father, he's like any proud father, and he just wants us to do well, and he gives us these things, and he gives us churches, and he gives us people to come alongside us. He keeps his spirit here, even though the son is at his right hand. He hasn't missed a beat, y'all. 
there's real opportunity today for us to just say, I want to step into this. We saw what Stacy did earlier, and she said, I want, to, I want to deepen my walk with Christ, and I want to grow in him, and, and we're invited to do that every day. And you don't even have to get baptized. If you've already been baptized, you don't have to do it again necessarily. You can just say, I want to keep growing in Christ. Maybe that's just some recommitment and re-upping with the Lord and saying, I've strayed a little bit. I've lost my focus, and I want to get back to real joy, as Paul describes to these people there in Philippi. You can have that. You don't have to, like, jump in a DeLorean and go back thousands of years. There's joy today in 2024. And again, we've talked about rise above. we got to go vertical. Don't stay horizontal. Life will suck you in. Man, life will suck you in. But we say glory to God. We say, God, you are able. God, you are greater. God, you can do these things. And you watch. <laughs> and the stories unfold of God's amazing power. Do you know him today? Do you know the beauty of God as a personal savior through Jesus Christ? If you don't, friend, today's a great day to say, I want to call upon him. I need Jesus like never before. Man, we invite you to do that. And if you are, a believer. Praise the Lord. Maybe it's time to step in in a church life. Maybe God's leading you to come be a part of our church family here. We'd love for you to do that. And we could talk to you. There'll be people up front and myself that would be glad to pray with you about these decisions. Or maybe it's just a re-up and say, man, I, I need a reset. I've kind of lost my focus. and I'm ready to come on home to Jesus and get my things in order. I want to give God glory in everything I do. Friend, all I know is the more I study this thing about joy, the more I realize God has already got it all. I just got to quit unplugging the cord periodically, like the clothing we talked about earlier. Put you on the Lord Jesus Christ. Live for him. Let's honor him. Father God, today is your day, not ours. But because of you, there is hope, there is freedom, there is joy, there is deliverance, there is power, there is strength, there is grace, there is abundant mercy. All these things avail themselves to us, Father, and we need that. Oh, we need you, Father. How dare we become so self-centered and arrogant and thinking we can manipulate joy in our lives or any other name inside of Jesus Christ. We can build our ivory towers and fill our garages with stuff, Father, but if, unless it's through you, there's no lasting joy in all that. There's headaches, there's misery, there's disappointments. May we return to you, Father. I know you're the riches. You bring the riches. You bring the things that are needed. And may we be used of you so that we can make your name great. And Father, I pray when we're just all said and done and the final amen occurs here today, I pray we give you a big smile. We just want to make you proud. Don't want to dishonor you. Forgive us where we fail you in this. To God be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.